Chapter 29, Malachite and the Tide. Erin stepped through the gateway with the others, her breath fogging in the chill of China's morning air. The horizon was just glowing with the rising sun, which seemed a little surreal to her, considering it was evening back in Colorado. She shook her head, thinking that humans weren't really meant to be able to traverse the globe quite so quickly. Once again, they were on a small hill overlooking the tide in the distance. Celestia and Luna, standing side by side, were regarding the tide with matching somber expressions. Erin glanced sidelong at Celestia, wondering how the princess felt coming back to face the thing that had once hurt her so badly. She reflected with a fluttering anxiety that she'd have a chance to find out how that felt for herself, once Malachi showed up. There is. Something strange, Luna said. A song. No, not a song. A series of rapid tones, continuously repeating, coming from the tide. It is quite. Eerie. Do you have any idea what it may be? Celestia asked her, and Luna shook her head. Nay, sister. It is simply there. I am surprised that you can't hear it, it is very. Annoying. I did listen, but I didn't hear anything, Celestia admitted, turning to face the tide once again. It must be some sort of a signal, Erin offered. When Twilight nudged her she quickly added, Princesses. Maybe, but what is its purpose? Celestia asked. At a guess, Princess, I'd say it's probably the method the tide uses to disrupt our scanning equipment. Or, maybe it controls the nanomachines. Erin said excitedly. If there's some way to disrupt or change that signal, maybe we can stop the tide that way. The humans have never noticed this signal, Luna asked. We don't have a lot of information on the tide, Princess, Erin explained. It's that interference I mentioned before. Most of our equipment is useless when we get too close to it. Ah, I see, Luna replied, gazing back out at the tide. Another small group of guards trotted through the gateway from Equestria, and Erin heard Twilight suck in her breath in surprise as she saw the stallion in the lead. Shining armor. You're here. Of course, the stallion smiled back somberly. I'm just sorry I wasn't here during your first attempt. Things might have gone differently. I had determined that escorting the Griffin High Consul to Equestria was more important, at that time, Celestia said in response, stepping forward. But I'm glad you're here. We can put that shield of yours to some use. Yes, princess, the stallion replied, snapping a salute. Should I fire it up now? Celestia shook her head. No, save your strength for now. I'll let you know. Yes, princess, he said, saluting again. Celestia moved back to talk with her sister, allowing Twilight unfettered access to her brother once again, which she made full use of. Erin smiled, and decided to stay well back to allow her friend all the time she needed to bond with him again. That was, until Twilight walked over with her brother, stating, this is her, shining. The human I was telling you about. Erin smiled weakly at the stallion as he gave her a discerning look, as if measuring the likelihood and severity of the harm that Twilight might come to in her company. Pleasure to meet you, he said, finally, though Erin doubted his sincerity. I've. Ah, uh, I've heard a lot about you, Erin replied lamely. Twilight talks about you all the time. Which wasn't entirely true. Erin wouldn't have even known her friend had a brother if it weren't for an offhand comment she'd made a week or so ago about her BBBFF. Since then, though, Erin and Twilight had talked quite a bit about their respective brothers, comparing notes and sharing stories, and exchanging viewpoints as to what it was like to be the older sister versus being the younger. She hasn't talked about you much at all, Shining said flatly, then grimaced when Twilight elbowed him sharply in the ribs. I mean, we haven't had a chance to talk much, since she's met you, he corrected. Tully, I have to get back on duty, in case the princesses need me. You be careful, and get back through that gate if things go wrong, okay? I'll be fine, Twilight said, rolling her eyes. Go and do your guard thing. We'll get together after it's all over, okay? Shining armor nodded. That sounds like a plan. It was nice to meet you, Erin, he said, then trotted off to stand near the princesses. Sorry about that, Twilight said once her brother was out of earshot. He doesn't seem to like me. It's not that, he just tends to get a little overprotective, sometimes. It's in his nature. Well, if he's concerned that our friendship has put you in danger, he's not really wrong, is he? Erin dug at the ground with a hoof when she said that, only to grunt in surprise when Twilight employed that same elbow she'd previously used on shining armor on her ribs. None of that, now, the unicorn said. The risks I take are my decisions. Nopany is forcing me to be out here, you know. This is my choice. The others feel the same way. Erin nodded, but kept her thoughts to herself. The two of them lapsed into silence while waiting, and the minutes dragged on. The tension steadily mounted as the morning wore on. Erin could feel her heart beating heavily in her chest as she shifted from hoof to hoof in the cold air, the anxiety and anticipation making her feel nauseous and restless at the same time. She really didn't want to be here. If it weren't for her friends, she'd never willingly come within a thousand miles of Malachite. Or the tide, for that matter. Luna and Celestia were talking to each other quietly, making last-minute plans in case things went wrong. Twilight and her other friends simply stood around, occasionally talking briefly, but mostly just remaining quiet. Not even Pinkie Pie could find much to say. I imagine we'll find out soon, Celestia said in reply to something Luna had said. He's here. Erin's heart jumped into her throat as she saw a truck pull up about forty feet away. The initial surges of panic raced through her as the large, intimidating green alicorn stepped out from the back, the entire bed of the truck raising dramatically once relieved of his weight. He flexed his wings, looking around with apparent curiosity. Then he looked towards the group. Erin's breath caught as his gaze touched her briefly. She felt cold, as if ice water had been poured down her back, and she started shivering. His eyes moved on, resting on Celestia, and he began walking towards the group. Erin was trembling now, shaking like a leaf. At that moment, the only thing that kept her from running back through the gate and abandoning her friends was her absolute terror of Malachite, her inability to turn her back on him. She shrank down as he approached, instinctively making herself as small as possible. As ashamed as she was of her cowardice, it was all that kept her hooves rooted firmly to the ground. And then something lightly, delicately, brushed across her back. Erin gave a strangled squeak of surprise and turned to see Fluttershy on her left, smiling softly at her, her delicate yellow wing placed gently across her withers. To her right, Applejack moved in and stood close by, shoulder touching shoulder. 
Twilight Sparkle moved to stand in front of her, and Rarity stepped over to stand next to her fellow unicorn. Rainbow Dash hovered protectively overhead, while Pinkie Pie stood next to Fluttershy, giving Erin an encouraging nod of support. Her friends wore matching expressions of determination and defiance as they stared at the approaching Malachite, and Erin felt a rising determination of her own. She wasn't any less terrified, but her friends supporting her strengthened her resolve. She took a bracing breath, and stood to face her nightmare. Tilda Tilda Asterisk Tilda Tilda. Malachite stepped out of the aircraft, stretching his wings and legs. Too long cramped into a tiny cabin had worn off any appreciation he'd had for these machines, and he was all too eager to finish his part in this. The truck he was led to had slightly more room for him than the aircraft, though it was not as nicely appointed. He knelt down in the back, sighing with annoyance every time the clumsy vehicle bounced over the uneven, unpaved road. They were bringing him from the nearest airfield to the site where the gate to Equestria had been opened up. It had been one of the conditions the humans had placed upon him, yet another sign of the distrust. They wanted Celestia nearby, and the princess had acquiesced, which meant that he would have to face his former teacher once again. Malachite wasn't certain how he felt about that, both eagerness and anxiety mixed in his heart as he thought of seeing Celestia for the first time since his escape from the cavern. Finally, the accursed vehicle stopped, and he stepped out to stretch once again. He glanced around, spotting the equestrians on a nearby hill. There was quite a large group, though it seemed to mostly consist of royal guards and a few humans. He didn't care about the others, though. He only had eyes for one of them, the glorious figure of Princess Celestia, her multi-hued mane tumbling gently on an ethereal wind. He forced down his fears and held on to his confidence. Reminding himself that he had nothing to fear, not really, he wrapped himself in a cloak of his own dignity and walked resolutely towards the hillside. Malachite, she said as he approached, inclining her head in greeting. My princess, he replied, utilizing the court stallion's bow that he hadn't used for centuries, neck arched and forehead pressed down to a bent knee. Am I, still? Celestia asked, sounding surprisingly wistful. Always, he replied, smiling up at her. The smile froze as he saw Luna peering at him quietly from behind her elder sister's shoulder. He hadn't even noticed the night princess standing there. Luna quirked an eyebrow at him, and he realized that he'd been staring at her for a very long moment. Celestia insisted on coming. She still has some sympathy for her former student, Luna said in response to his unasked question. And, frankly, I do not trust you to not take advantage of that fact. He bit back for the first reply that came to mind, unwilling to spit bile at Celestia's sister when the sun princess was standing right in front of him. A wise precaution, he said, instead. Though, I hope that I will demonstrate my loyalty after today. If you manage to stop the tide, I will judge all of your crimes that I currently know of in Equestria to be forgiven, Celestia said, and Malachite wondered at the odd emphasis. You will be welcomed back home, provided, of course, that the humans don't want you for any crimes here. A human stepped forward, a black-haired male that Malachite vaguely remembered as one of the first humans to come through the gateway all those weeks ago in the Cantalot Gardens. Princess, if he stops the tide, we'll give him his own island as just the first of many thank-you gifts, the human said in an accented voice. Well, with a private island on the line, how can I allow myself to fail? Malachite said with a dry smile. We will have to discuss the means of containing those face sprites, though, Celestia said, regarding his mane with obvious distaste. His face wore mane and tail retraced almost completely into his body before he realized that he was instinctively trying to hide them from Celestia's disapproving glare. He forced himself to relax. Once I'm through with this, tight, I won't need them anymore, Malachite assured her. The same spell that I used to sever my mind from my original body will remove me from the swarm, and seal me into this body instead. That was my plan, at any rate. Celestia and Luna both looked surprised at that, though Luna's face was tempered with suspicion. Malachite then looked away, finally taking a real look at the other ponies who had gathered on this side of the gate, stopping when he recognized the determined-looking faces of a specific six mares. The elements of harmony, he asked Celestia, feeling amused, uneasy and saddened at the same time. Luna alone isn't enough insurance. He couldn't keep the bitterness out of his voice when he said that. Don't mistake my intentions, Malachite, Celestia said with more than just a little steel. I don't entirely trust you. Any hint of betrayal, and I'll unleash the elements. Then her tone softened, and she continued on by saying, but they aren't here for you, alone. I'm hoping that, if you fail, the elements may still be able to work after all. Malachite blinked, taken by surprise. Celestia wasn't one to try a failed tactic twice. She had to know that he'd seen the security footage of her attempt to stop the tide, he told Luna as much, after all. What is she planning? He wondered. Malachite regarded the ponies near the gate. In addition to the element bearers, he saw another familiar face, scowling at him from amongst the mares. Initially, Erin Sunflower flinched away from his scrutiny, but then she turned back to face him. He could see the fear in her eyes, and the loathing, but he also saw the bright hot iron of her anger. He hesitated, remembering Maggie Henson's admonition not to approach her, but as he was already here, it was too late for him to avoid her. He dropped his own gaze, and then performed the same bow to her that he had for Celestia. Erin Sunflower. What I did to you was unforgivable. I know you may not ever accept my apologies, but I offer them sincerely, and with the whole of my heart. He maintained the bow while Erin struggled to find a reply. Finally, she spoke to him, in a low voice that he might not have caught if it weren't for his enhanced hearing. I still have nightmares about it, she said, quietly. He flinched, and looked up. The fear was gone from her eyes, now, but the hatred and anger were stronger than ever. I will never forget what you did, Malachite, she said, louder than before. No matter how you apologize, no matter what you say, what you did to me will never be all right. He sighed and began straightening up from his bow when Erin started speaking again. But, if you save my world, then I'll thank you. I might even try to forgive you, a little. But I'll never like you, I'll never trust you, and I'll never forget. Of course not, he said, bowing again. He doubted that she understood the significance of this act, a noblest toy in bowing to one who was, essentially, a commoner. It didn't matter. It was her due, and he was deeply in her debt. After a long moment he stood, nodding briefly to Celestia once again. 
My princess, I must go. I don't know how long this will take, but I hope to be back before the day's end. Wish me well. He hated the note of pleading in his voice, but he hadn't been able to stop it. Celestia nodded, and Malachi turned to walk away. Wait, Celestia called, and Malachi glanced back in surprise. The princess had a brief argument with her sister and a unicorn guard, presumably about him. She cut him off with a sharp unfolding of her wings, after which she descended down the hillside alone to join him, leaving Luna and the unicorn captain both staring grimly at him. Walk with me, please, she said. Malachi nodded, trying to hide his shock at this turn of events. He couldn't help but notice that he was taller than she was, now. The observation both thrilled and worried him. He wondered what Celestia thought of that. Would she resent him for making himself larger, or would she be impressed by his larger stature? He was no true alicorn, he knew, just a reasonably close facsimile. Would she consider him some sort of parody of herself, meant in ridicule, or perhaps see him some sort of a monster, a non-pony to be despised? Or did she secretly admire his newfound strength? Did she, with her vast age and wisdom, consider him a child simply pretending to be a grown-up? Her face and demeanor gave him no clues. Luna detected some sort of tone, or signal, from the tide. I was not able to detect it myself, Celestia said, but perhaps that information will be useful to you. Thank you, Princess, Malachite said. He'd been expecting that, or something of the sort. In fact, his plan hinged on it. Once they'd gotten well out of earshot of the others, Celestia stopped. Malachite regarded her warily, and the princess looked back at him soberly. The human died, she said, finally. The. I'm sorry, Malachite said, confused. An old man was found dead in the woods after he and his wife had vanished from their homes in the dead of night. Malachite had no idea what she was talking about at first, and then his expression froze as he remembered his nighttime excursion. The two humans, the female pleading with the male to return home. His mind reeled with disbelief and denial. The human had died. No, it couldn't be his fault. He'd left them alive. They should have been fine. Celestia was simply regarding him with a sad look, and Malachite struggled with the urge to deny it, to feign ignorance. But he knew his silence had gone on too long, more than long enough to damn him. How? he asked finally. Exposure and hypothermia. His wife will recover, though of course she's lost her husband. Guilt racked him, but he also felt a surge of anger. Were humans really so delicate that they would die simply from being left outside for a few hours? How was he supposed to know that? It wasn't his fault. He shook his head, with his thoughts still chasing each other around in circles. Hypothermia. The night hadn't seemed cold to him at all, but his senses were badly dulled when he was out of his body. He felt the chill of the morning now, but it wouldn't feel like much of anything if he simply left his physical body behind. A stupid mistake. His anger turned towards himself. How could he have forgotten how dead his senses were when he was in his sprite form? The old human had died, and it was his fault. He couldn't deny it. What do you intend to do, princess? He asked, fearing the answer. The humans believe, or at least they want to believe, that it was a coincidence, Celestia replied solemnly. The disappointment in her eyes crushed him. They still want you to attempt what you can to save their world. I will bow to their wishes. I can only hope that you make it worth it, my former student. His anger and defensiveness faded, leaving only the guilt and shame behind. He'd killed before, animals who'd been the subjects of his experiments, but never a sapient creature. Aside from the fake queen whose swarm he'd stolen, of course, but that hardly counted. And now he was responsible for the death of a human, who had a life and a history of his own. Low frequencies, princess, he said. Celestia looked puzzled, and he explained, the face sprites. I investigated the weapons the humans produced to counter my sprites. The others may work as well, I don't know, I'm not familiar with all of their technologies. But the only one that I know for certain would work is the sonic cannon, if set to ultra-low frequencies. I'm not certain exactly what frequency would work best, the humans will have to figure that out, but it will drive the sprites back, hurt and confuse them. Thank you, Celestia said, surprised. I will share that information with the humans. Please do, Malachite whispered. Celestia nodded to him, then flew off without another word, returning to the group of ponies and humans on the hillside. Tilda tilde asterisk tilde tilde. The large screen that had been placed in the emitter room was being watched with undivided attention by several scientists and two very concerned parents. The screen itself was sectioned into several views, one of which showed the equestrians and Erin as they regarded the tide. Those princesses are impressive, Lynn said, with a brittle casualness intended to hide her anxiety. I wish we could have met them in person. Me too, her husband replied. The married couple stared at the screen for a while longer, until Lynn broke the silence once again. She seemed scared, she observed, squeezing John's hand. She could feel the tension in him, the desire to run off to stand by his child. She shared it, after all, but they had promised. I would be, too, John replied, knowing that she was in reference to Erin. Tense silence reigned again, until a large truck pulled up. Maggie clasped her hands together anxiously as Malachi stepped out of the back. Who's that guy? John asked. That is a guy pony, isn't it? Yes, Maggie replied. He's called Malachite, and he's a very different kind of pony. The humans watched as the large green alicorn approached and then started talking to the group from Equestria. At least he seems polite, Lynn said as the stallion bowed before the princesses. Erin looks terrified of him, John noted with concern. He turned to Maggie and asked sharply, why? Maggie hesitated. It wasn't her place to tell Erin's parents how she was victimized by that creature, but in her opinion it wasn't healthy for Erin to keep it from them, either. She had tried suggesting a couple of times to the girl that she should talk to her folks about what had happened, only to be told by Erin that she didn't want to burden them with it. Maggie suspected that Erin was just trying to repress it, not wanting to deal with it, as if pretending could make it not have happened. She was torn between her motherly desire to tell a fellow parent what happened to their child, and respect for Erin's privacy and right to tell her parents on her own. She opted for a middle ground. Most ponies that we've encountered are kind, friendly and polite. Malachite is not exactly a pony. He's more of an eldritch abomination from Equestria's distant past. Erin is right to be afraid of him. 
were having one abomination fight another. That sounds like a brilliant idea, John said with a heavy dose of sarcasm while Lin looked at her questioningly. Is Eren in any danger from that guy? Not with the princesses there, no, Maggie replied, pretending to be absorbed in examining her tablet. She glanced up to see Lin still staring at her. Dot. Lin was giving her an extremely knowing look that was making her uncomfortable. Maggie glanced away again, and Lin leaned over and whispered into her ear, too quietly for her husband to overhear. We'll talk about what that thing did to my daughter once she's out of danger, Eren's mother said in a voice that brooked no argument. Maggie's throat locked up, and she could only nod. Tilda tilda asterisk tilda tilda. The smell was atrocious, the chemicals burning his eyes and lungs. Though, from what he understood, that was from the humans' efforts to stem the tide on their own, and not the tide itself. He could smell, something, from the tide, a scent slightly reminiscent of damp soil, surprisingly mild when considering how enormous the tide was. Major Morris had met him near the edge of the tide, providing him with the gift of human technology. A simple headset which would allow him to record his findings for the humans for future study. Just in case the worst happens, and you can't get back to us the Major said. It's also got a tracking device, in case we need to find you. It probably won't work, considering the interference from the tide, but having it won't hurt you. Thank you, Malachite said, dryly. It's good to know you have a backup plan in case of my demise. It's nothing personal, the Major said, looking slightly uncomfortable. We haven't really had a good chance to get information on this thing. No matter what else happens, we can't lose this opportunity. I understand, Malachite said. Malachite levitated the device up to his head where it fit surprisingly comfortably. The Major explained that it would record everything he said, and everything he saw, at least while in his alicorn body. Malachite nodded, and he was surprised when Major Morris saluted him and wished him luck before he departed. Malachite extended his senses, listening for the tone that Celestia had mentioned. He found it, eventually, and listened in surprise. It reminded him somewhat of the signal the humans used to control the drones in Equestria. It had the same feel, though obviously very different in strength and substance. He cast around with his senses, trying to determine the source of the noise. As he suspected, it was coming from the same direction as the center, where the initial impact had occurred. Beginning recording of experimentation with entity known as, the Black Tide, Malachi dictated for the sake of the recording device. First, an analysis of the destructive properties of the tide. Then he concentrated, pulling a feeble thread of magic from the distant gateway, rather than depleting his own reserves, and used that to lift a nearby rock. Carefully, he lowered the rock into the nanring, the dark edge of the tide that was busily devouring the planet Earth. Almost immediately, it began to liquefy. Malachite lifted the remains out of the ring, lifting it higher and higher. The rock continued to dissolve, covered in the black tar of nanomachines that comprised the ring. Eventually, nothing was left beyond a seething ball of black, which he dropped back into the ring. The entire experiment had lasted mere seconds. Destruction of non-tide material in nanring happens alarmingly quickly, he dictated. Now to find out how that compares to the surface of the tide itself. Experiment number two required a rock of similar size to the first one, which he then tossed past the nanring. His enhanced vision tracked it as it landed on the tide proper, bouncing slightly after it hit. This rock began to dissolve as well, though much more slowly than the first. The nanomachines existed throughout the tide, he knew. The humans had determined that already, but they were either much less numerous past the ring, or they were less active. It took nearly three minutes for the rock to dissolve completely. Malachite nodded in satisfaction, and hefted a small boulder, much larger than the first rock. Grunting a bit with the strain, he hurled it out to the same location where he tested the rock. Ten minutes later, with the boulder only slightly reduced, he felt satisfied. Larger objects broke down much more slowly when placed in direct contact with the tide itself. He experimented a little more, dictating all the while as he sent a face sprite into the nanoring. The sprite descended, but was unable to possess any of the tiny machines present. Malachite frowned. Perhaps the nanomachines were simply too small. It wasn't often that he tried to have the sprites possess something smaller than they were. Or perhaps they weren't, alive, enough. In any case, possessing a group of nanomachines and turning them against their fellows wouldn't work. That had been a fallback plan, in any case. Destroying the tide in that way would take far too long, and require far too much of his attention. Assuming it would even work, of course. Still, it was disappointing that it wasn't an option. He recalled the sprite, glad to see it was no worse for wear for its descent into the deadly goo of the nanoring. Next, he pushed it into the body of the tide itself. A small patch of dark green haze appeared on the tide, but his connection to the sprite didn't tell him much of anything. That the tide was alive in some fashion was a given already, though the sprite confirmed it. In fact, it was positively brimming with life force, a fact that the sprite took full advantage of, feasting eagerly like a thirsty mouse sipping at the ocean. He left his body and, with great caution, lowered his own mind into the tide itself. And he was amazed. A seething sea of energy surrounded him, immeasurable and incomprehensible. He could sense no intelligence from it, but the size of the thing was beyond his understanding. The signal that he only vaguely sensed while in his body was much stronger here. Obviously, it was being broadcast through the body of the tide itself. It took Malachite a few seconds to acclimatize himself to the noise it created. He spread his face sprites around him, possessing as large of an area as he could. The sprites drank happily from the vast reservoir before them, but still obeyed his commands to investigate. The body of the tide was consistent throughout, with no variations that he could detect. No musculature, no vascular system, no nervous system. It was all very puzzling to him, and he wished that it were possible to get a sample of this thing underneath the microscope. Sending his sprites away, he sensed no variation in the tide's tissue. It simply existed, though obviously it had some method of motion, as it would ripple and bulge occasionally. The overall area he possessed was insufficient to do much of anything. His mind, and all of his sprites together, were nowhere near strong enough to take over the entirety of the tide. Another backup plan gone. He was grateful, indeed, for the presence of the signal. If it hadn't been there, he would have felt terribly silly facing the others after all of his bragging. Malachite pulled himself and his sprites back into his body, then took a moment to relate his findings for the sake of the recording device on his head. Then he backed away from the tide and launched himself clumsily into the air. 
He had possessed birds before, and he'd thought that flying would be easy, a thought that was rapidly dispelled as he tilted alarmingly towards the nanoring before he managed to correct himself. He let out a shuddering breath of relief as he pulled away and gained altitude. He'd put a lot of work into this body. It would be a pity if it ended up as just so much black sludge. He evened out soon enough, pointed himself to the west, and began flying. Once he was certain he was on the correct course, Malachi concentrated, bringing his magic to bear. Teleportation is a rare skill amongst unicorns. Before his transformation, Malachite had been unable to do it at all. It had simply been beyond his strength. However, he greatly expanded his magical capacity while building his new form, and he knew the rudiments of the spell required. A moment of concentration and a quick burst of magic later, and he was a good twenty miles further in. The momentary dizziness caused a loss of height until he managed to shake it off, and he climbed for more altitude before he made his next jump. No need to risk plummeting into the tide after a teleport, after all. He flew on, letting his magic storage organs recharge somewhat before making another jump. This time, he wasn't certain how far he'd managed, as the area around him all looked the same, the featureless dull black of the tide. He flew on, trying to determine if the signal was any stronger. He decided that it was, and coasted on the thermals that the tide produced while waiting for his magic to recharge once again. He continued on that way for hours. Glide, teleport, glide, teleport. Finally, he reached the center. The signal here was so strong it almost overpowering, giving him his first real headache in eight centuries. Somewhere below him was the original impact site. Somewhere below him, the source of the signal, and his means of controlling the tide itself. He left a single sprite controlling his body, instructing it to simply circle the area, and took the rest to descend and search. He pushed the swarm through the body of the tide, casting them out further and further, trying to find out the source of the signal. He could feel the swarm expanding as it drank from the tide's life essence, growing larger and stronger. Malachi clamped his control down, forcing the swarm to remain at a manageable size. He'd been in control of this swarm for centuries, and they obeyed him, though reluctantly. There was easily enough energy here to spawn a hundred million queens or more, each with its own sizable swarm. Finally, the swarm found the source of the signal, a twisted mass of cells easily three times the size of his alicorn body. The pulse that guided the nanomachines came from here. He quelled his excitement and proceeded carefully, sinking several of his sprites into it, analyzing the signal and the organic device that generated it. He couldn't understand it, it was too far beyond him. However, he could stop the signal, and he did so. A quick mental command, and the nanomachine stopped, the omnipresent crackling sounds of the earth being reformed into the tide stopping all at once. Perfect. He had contained the tide. Even if he managed no more than this, he was certain that Celestia would allow him back into Equestria. Still. His curiosity demanded more answers, and his pride wouldn't allow him to simply halt the expansion. He thought of Celestia's reaction if he managed to actually destroy this menace, and decided to press on. The swarm spread out, trying to determine the nature of this creature, seeking for answers. There were none. Malachi quickly grew frustrated, pouring more and more of his awareness into the center of the tide, leaving just the smallest tether back to his body. Nothing. There was nothing beyond what he'd already seen and sensed. He began to withdraw his mind back into his own body when, with a shock, he found that he could not. Something was holding him fast, pinning his mind. It had enveloped him without him even noticing. He expanded his gaze, trying to sense where the force holding him was coming from. What he found filled him with a cold terror the likes of which he'd never felt before. The mind of the tide pressed in all around him. He hadn't noticed it for the same reason that a fish didn't notice the water, it was simply the environment in which he moved, and it was too enormous to take in all at once. The tide had a mind and presence that stretched across the horizon, so enormous that he had less than the presence of a gnat before it. And, now, the tide was aware of him. It was as if the land itself, stretching from horizon to horizon, had suddenly reared up, alive and aware, and opened an eye ten leagues wide to look at him. Terror gripped him and he tried to flee, to pull his mind back into his alicorn body, but the mind of the tide held him firmly. He felt his consciousness being examined, not with curiosity, but with a systematic and clinical detachment. No. He screamed silently, struggling furiously, desperate to get away. He sent a command to the face sprites he'd left in the signal source, trying to activate the inverse of the signal from before, hoping that doing so would instruct the nanomachines to work their way inwards rather than out. The tide stopped the sprites, studying them with the same passionless attention with which it had examined him. At the same time, Malachi felt his memories of the sprites, their capabilities and weaknesses, being examined by the entity that held him. Then, with no apparent effort, the tide stripped the swarm away from him, absorbing them all, taking the willing swarm into itself. The signal started again, and the nanomachies once again began to devour the earth. His alicorn body, stripped of the sprite controlling it, fell on top of the tide and immediately began slowly dissolving. The pain he felt at the swarm being pulled away from him was nothing compared to what happened when the tide returned its attention to him, calmly stripping off a part of his mind, his identity. Malachite screamed in horror as he felt an intimate part of himself stripped away by this thing. It examined what it had taken from him, a part of his awareness, his memory, without curiosity. And then the tide swallowed it whole before resuming its examination of his very being. In short order, another piece of his consciousness was stripped away, absorbed into the tide itself. Tilda tilde asterisk tilde tilde. It had been hours since Malachite had flown down to the edge of the tide, and there were still no changes. Celestia didn't fidget like the others, but she did worry. Malachite's departure had at least dispelled some of the tension from earlier in the morning. The ponies had passed the tide chatting amiably, keeping the conversation light and avoiding the subject of the tide and whether or not Malachite would betray them, though the princess was certain it was on every pony's mind. Erin had brought out her tablet and was showing her friends various videos and games found on the internet. Celestia was glad for the distraction, watching a few of the videos herself. Quite suddenly, so suddenly that it was startling, the noise of the nanomachines stopped. The unexpected silence was surreal. The ponies looked at each other warily. Had Malachite done it? Had he managed to shut down the tide? Minutes stretched by. Only centuries of self-imposed training kept Celestia from shifting nervously from hoof to hoof, like many of the others were. 
Princess, look, Twilight said, pointing. The signature dark green haze of Malachite's possession had suddenly started forming above the tide, spreading quickly across the surface. Celestia braced herself. If Malachite was to betray them, it would likely be soon. Shining Armor apparently agreed, as the future dome of his shield spell enveloped the hillside and the surrounding area, covering as many of the human workers nearby as the captain was able to reach. Be careful, girls. Be ready to use the elements. All pretense of casualness was gone as the bearers of the elements took up position near the princess. Minutes passed with nothing happening. And then, as unexpectedly as the nanomachines had stopped, they started again, once again filling the air with the crackling sounds of the earth being consumed. Celestia frowned. Had Malachite failed? Or, had he betrayed them? She thought she knew the answer once the familiar green lights of the face sprites rose above the tide. Millions upon millions of them, blinking ominously, with more appearing every second. And then the sprites rushed outwards, towards the humans and ponies around the border of the tide. People and ponies screamed in horror as the sprites drew near, and Celestia cursed in a language that had been dead for centuries. She'd been a fool to trust him. Sister, Luna cried in warning, as the tide's psychic attack slammed down upon them. Shining armor grunted and fell to his knees as his shield buckled, then shattered. The mind that had attacked was familiar to her, and Celestia was struck with the realization that it wasn't Malachite who was attacking them. The tide was still very much in control of itself. Perhaps it somehow controlled the sprites, as well. The captain staggered upwards and began casting his spell once again, just in time to catch a second assault as it happened. The shield broke again, and this time Shining Armor shouted in pain as he fell, his sister's cries of concern echoing across the hillside. The unicorns amongst her royal guards were repeatedly casting the spell to destroy the sprites, but it was a losing battle. There were simply too many to be stopped. The entire field below them was blanketed with sprites swarming towards them, and the open gateway behind her. Tilda tilde asterisk tilde tilde. What the hell is that? John Olsen shouted in alarm at the video coming through the screen. The entirety of the black tide was blanketed in a dark haze, with lights like sickly fireflies blinking and shifting through the shadows. Face sprites, Maggie said, horrified. There were so many, so many. Even with the news of how to repel them, there were more than enough to doom humanity. Prepare to close the gate to China, she shouted to her crew. Wait for my order. What? Lin shrieked. Our daughter is over there. John was already running towards the gate to Equestria, making good on his promise to save his daughter. Those things can't be allowed through the gateway, Maggie answered grimly. It's bad enough that they're on Earth, but if they infest Equestria, too, there will be nowhere we can run to. What do they do? Lin asked in a horrified whisper. They possess creatures, people, animals, whatever. They possess them and suck out their energy. You can't leave Erin there, Lin said, grabbing Maggie by the lab coat. I won't, Maggie promised, not unless there's no other way to stop them gaining access to Equestria. Lin stared at her, furious, before running after her husband. Tilda tilde asterisk tilde tilde. Jim Dunning was a contractor for Arclight Industries, one of the key contractors enlisted to fight the tide in India. He gaped in blank incomprehension as a massive number of green lights rose up out of the tide. Jim, what is that? One of his co-workers asked. I don't know, man. I don't like it, he replied. The lights just kept on appearing as the minutes rolled by, while the men muttered uncomfortably to each other. A few started making their way hastily away from the tide, and Jim decided that wasn't at all a bad idea. He arrived at his decision far too late. The lights moved towards him at an alarming speed, and the men around him screamed in startled terror. James was vaguely aware that he was screaming as well as he tried desperately to scramble away from the blinking green cloud swarming him. He flailed his arms instinctively, ineffectively. There were just too many. All he could do was run. He slammed into a friend of his, Charlie McKenzie, who was standing ramrod straight and ignoring the green lights around him. Charlie. Move, man. What the hell is? Jimmy broke off as what looked like black smoke erupted from the man before him. He stumbled back in shocked horror from the apparently burning man, who stood there as if oblivious to what was happening to him. And then, one of the green lights sank into Jim's own skull. He stopped struggling, his mind dulling instantly. A small part of him was still aware, still watching what was going on. He sensed an awareness scrutinizing him, and he felt himself examined, pinned down by the alien mind like an amoeba under a microscope. There wasn't a voice, so much as an awareness of intent. Jimmy's mind translated it into words that he could understand. Classification, human. Identity, James Walter Dunning. Age, 12,411 days. Cataloging data. What part of his mind was still aware of what was happening to him screamed in utter revulsion at what happened next, as his entire life began playing out before him. He was aware of that awareness watching, with a cold and calculating eye, as it recorded everything as if it had some right to his innermost thoughts. He couldn't fight it. There was no way to even begin. And then, just before he gave up hope, the world exploded with a brilliant white light. Tilda tilde asterisk tilde tilde. Girls. The elements of harmony, now. The six friends nodded, and focused. A moment later, a light appeared over the field, and the rainbow of harmony struck the tide, washing over it once again. Celestia felt her heart clench, certain that Malachite was either dead or dying. If the tide hadn't killed him, there was a good chance that the elements would do so. As before, the rainbow spread out, following the tide across the horizon. More and more energy poured from Twilight and her friends, considerably more than Celestia had ever seen the elements produce before. Fear gripped her as she realized that the elements would quickly consume the magic that Twilight and her friends had stored, leaving the job unfinished, even with the gateway to Equestria directly behind them and feeding them energy. Luna, she said, gather your strength, and deliver it to the bearers. Her sister nodded, focusing her power. Celestia did the same, and the rainbow of harmony increased in intensity and speed as it spread across the surface of the tide. Later on, the humans would show her the satellite images of what they'd accomplished. In the video, a small speck of light started from their location, bright and shining like a star against the darkness of the tide. Then it spread, slowly at first but with increasing speed. Within minutes, the entirety of the black tide was enveloped prismatic aurora of shifting lights, which danced and played over the surface of the earth. It was an eerie and oddly beautiful sight. Tilda tilde asterisk tilde tilde. 
The phase swarm expanded rapidly, consuming the life force of the tide greedily, and yet not even making a dent in the overall energy present there. Every few seconds, their numbers would double, as the sprites drank as quickly as they could manage from the life force before them. When Malachite had controlled the swarm, his greater intellect and will had allowed him to control a swarm that had been several times larger than even the strongest of the Fae Queens. The swarm that the tide could produce would be enormous, enough to blanket the Earth and Equestria combined. Malachite wasn't concerned with that, not because it was unimportant, but because there was precious little of him left, the butchered remains of his mind floating in the tide like a grain of rice in the ocean. The tide had taken nearly everything from him, his memories, his intellect, nearly all of his understanding. All that remained was a spark, the very center of his soul. He was only dimly aware of the power of the elements racing across the surface and infusing itself into the organism beneath it. And he was only aware of that because of the confusion that the tide experienced. What remained of his ravaged consciousness felt a grim satisfaction as the mental presence of the tide receded under the rainbow wave of light. The tide released its grip on him, and some vestige of instinct caused him to move his mind back into the ravaged body of the green alicorn slowly dissolving on top of the tide. He nestled in his former body for whatever comfort it could give him. The tide was trying to analyze the situation. It knew it was under assault, but it didn't understand the origin or the cause. All it knew was that something strange and powerful was streaking along its surface it, changing it as it went. Almost at the last moment, the tide sundered itself from the face swarm it had just consumed, somehow understanding that it was the swarm that made it vulnerable. The sprites, bereft of any controlling mind, shriveled and died under the rainbow light of harmony. Malachite felt the light of the elements wash over him, as well. Unlike his last experience, the light was warm, rather than burning. Comforting, rather than harsh. He gave himself up to it with a sense of relief. It almost felt like he was coming home, at last. Tilda tilde asterisk tilde tilde. Exhausted, Celestia fell to her knees, and was aware of her sister and the bearers doing the same. The only one on their hooves were her guards, busily buzzing around her and Luna, and Eren, who was checking on her friends. Eren's father, much to Celestia's surprise, was hovering behind his daughter, apparently trying to urge her back through the gateway, but Eren was waving him off, insisting on staying with her friends. Dimly, she became aware of the cheering from the humans. Those who remained conscious, at least. She regarded the immobile stone that had once been the tide with a feeling far beyond loathing. It was likely that Malachite hadn't betrayed them, after all. But if Malachite had still been alive before the elements were used, then it was likely that this thing had just forced her to destroy her former student. She staggered to her hooves, the proximity of the gateway to Equestria helping to restore her power. Luna was already standing, and moved to stand by her side. Is it over? Luna asked. Is it done? I can't be certain, Celestia replied. It seems that it might be. Princess, Eren said, her voice sounding shaken. Celestia looked at her and saw fear in her eyes. Twilight and the others, they aren't waking up. Celestia and Luna both moved quickly to check on them, and Celestia breathed a sigh of relief when she determined the cause of their unconsciousness. They will be fine, she assured the near-frantic human. The elements demanded a lot out of them, and they simply need lots of rest to recover. Celestia noticed that shining armor was groggily staggering up to his hooves. She turned to the captain of her Pegasus guards and said, Captain Stormfront, please go through the gateway and tell the medical staff that we have ponies here who need bed rest, lots of peace and quiet, and plenty of fluids and food when they wake up. Make sure that they know that Captain Shining Armor is included in those orders. The guard nodded and trotted quickly away, ignoring his fellow captain's protests that he was fine and didn't need any rest. Celestia flipped her wings open and flew down to the edge of the tide. She cast out her mind as strongly as she was able to, which wasn't very strongly at all, at the moment. She could detect nothing, no tide, no malachite. She knelt down to the ground, completely exhausted. Mentally, emotionally and magically, she had nothing left. Perhaps her former student had lived, perhaps he hadn't. As much as she wished to go searching, she knew that she couldn't. There simply wasn't the strength left in her, after the elements had taken the dew. Luna landed softly beside her, kneeling down and folding an ebony wing across her back and pulling her in close. Celestia let the tears flow as she leaned into Luna's embrace, accepting the comfort her sister had to offer her. Minutes passed before she felt strong enough to stand again. Luna stood with her, not asking questions, simply being there for her. It was enough, for now. Celestia walked to the border of the tide, now featureless grey stone. The nanaring itself was a smoothly frozen black mass, fossilized by the power of the elements. She reared up, then flashed down with both her hooves, striking the edge of what had been the tide. Cracks appeared, radiating out from where she'd struck. She reared again, and once again struck down with all the force she could muster. Again and again, Celestia hit the petrified remains of the tide, taking out her rage and frustration on an enemy that could no longer feel it. Finally she stopped, panting for breath. She felt embarrassed, almost ashamed at her display. But she did feel better and more in control of herself than she had before. She looked back to her sister, standing behind her, and saw no judgment, only sympathy and concern. Celestia straightened up and walked wearily back to the gateway. My student, Malachite, is out there somewhere, she told Major Morris, who was still standing by the gateway to Equestria, coordinating efforts of the human medical staff who were pouring through the gateway to attend to the humans who'd been victimized by the sprites. Obviously, those in need of medical attention come first. But, please, when you can, see if you can find him. Or his, his remains, if there are any. Yes, ma'am, the Major replied, saluting. Celestia nodded, and made her way to the gate. For now, she was content to leave it for the humans to determine if the threat was over or not. At the moment, she simply wanted to return to Equestria. Chapter 30, Aftershocks. When she finally had an idle moment, Erin reflected that her sense of time was now completely off-kilter. This day seemed to have lasted for far longer than it possibly could have. It had felt like a long day even before she'd gone through the gate hours earlier to find the sun just rising in China. And now it was just after midnight, and it felt like days had passed since she'd last slept. Medical staff from Cantalot had been on call on the Equestria side of the gate, rushing through once they were given the all-clear. It had taken Erin some time to convince her father that the danger was past and that he could stop trying to pull Erin back through the gate. 
At Erin's suggestion, he had been put to use helping her get friends back through to Equestria, picking up the unconscious ponies and placing them on the gurneys for transfer to the castle infirmary. Shining Armor himself had to be ordered to get some rest. The doctor had to insist, pulling rank on the obviously exhausted unicorn who'd been hovering over his unconscious sister. Erin had timidly offered to watch over Twilight for him, and had been surprised by the captain's obvious gratitude. Erin had stayed in the infirmary with her friends, anxious and jittery, until a frustrated nurse had kindly but firmly ejected her, promising that news would be brought to the harmonics compound should any pony's conditions change. She'd gone to tell Shining that her sister was stable and sleeping, only to find out that he, himself, was deep in a well-deserved state of sleep. Erin had then dragged her hooves all the way back to the harmonics gateway, reluctantly deciding that she should at least try to get some sleep herself, even though the day's events had left her head and heart whirling. The atmosphere of cautious joy on the earth side of the gate prompted a small smile on Erin's features. She stopped to listen as the scientists and engineers reported the latest news loudly across the room to one another. A reverent hush fell across the room as satellite images were brought in and thrown up on one of the larger screens on the wall, with people crowding around to look at the patch of grey that had replaced the dull black of the tide. After a few minutes they began whispering to each other excitedly, keeping their voices low, as if afraid to disturb this moment with too much exuberance, or to tempt fate by suggesting that the tide might truly be finished. Erin looked dully at the screen, feeling numb. It was an ugly sight, she decided. Not as ugly as the tide was, but the roughly circular grey mark on the Earth's surface wasn't pretty in the least, surrounded as it was by the greens and browns of the living Earth, and the blue of the sea. She wondered idly if that part of the world would ever recover, or if it would always be scarred that way. She wandered away, jaw cracking as she yawned, realizing that she didn't know what had happened to her parents. The last she could recall seeing of them was in the Cantalot Infirmary, but she now realized that she hadn't actually seen them for an hour, at least. She decided to forgive herself for not paying attention, since she'd been a little preoccupied by the fact that her friends weren't waking up. That, and other things that she preferred not to think about. Erin stumbled her way back to her room, deciding that she was both hungry and too tired to bother eating anything before bed. She felt like she should be happier than she was, but her mind felt muffled and indistinct, and the possibility of the tide's destruction seemed too unreal to accept right now. She was more than half certain they'd find out that the rock they saw was just a thin shell, that the tide was still growing underneath, as deadly and implacable as ever. The possibility of the tide being gone was a concept that was so incredibly huge that the impact on her life wasn't something that she could even begin to wrap her head around at the moment. That her friends had so completely exhausted and endangered themselves for her planet's sake made her feel both proud of them and incredibly guilty that they had taken such a huge risk. And as for Malachite. She shook her head, deciding that she was too tired to think about that now. Sleep first, worry in the morning. She was nearing the corner to her room in the harmonics compound when a pair of familiar voices stopped her in her tracks. Her parents were outside her room once again, sitting on the floor by the doorway. Erin smiled and trotted around the corner. Mom, Dad, hi, she said, glad to see them, even though all she wanted to do was sleep. It seems like the tide might be gone, isn't that amazing? Hi, sweetie, her mother said, standing up. Erin froze as her parents shared a look. Something was up, and she wasn't sure if she had the energy to deal with it right at that moment. Can we come in, her father asked, gesturing at the door. Well, I was thinking of getting some sleep. Erin trailed off, seeing that her parents wouldn't be deterred. Sure, she said with a sigh, walking up and opening her door. Come on in. Everyone entered her main room, and Erin immediately picked up on the awkward atmosphere. A small ember of annoyance started to flare up. She was burned out, at the moment. After going through the chaos of the shopping trip, the encounter with Malachite, her friends being unconscious and everything that had happened with the tide, she felt tapped out, running on empty. She decided to simply get to the point. So, what's going on? She asked bluntly. Ah. Well, first of all, are you all right? Lynn asked hesitantly. We saw those glowing, sprite things. They didn't hurt you, did they? No, Erin replied with a wan smile. My friends were able to take them out before they got close enough to threaten me. Those sprites, her father said slowly. They were from that thing called Malachite, right? Ah, Erin trailed off. They knew something, she could see it in their faces. Erin's eyes narrowed, and she almost screamed with frustration. What did Maggie tell you? She asked, far more harshly than she'd intended. Maggie didn't tell us anything, Lynn replied calmly. She told us what those sprites were and what they could do. She refused to tell us anything else, but we were able to draw some conclusions when we saw how terrified you were of him. I wasn't scared of him, Erin lied. We saw the video, honey, John said, shaking his head. You were more frightened than I've ever seen you before. Erin looked away, glaring at the corner of her bed. Her eyes felt hot, and she wondered angrily why her parents couldn't just leave well enough alone, let her get the sleep she needed. She pressed her lips together in a frown and didn't say a thing. Look, Lynn put a hand on her shoulder, and Erin nearly jerked away from her. Erin, you don't have to talk about it right now, if you don't want to. Nothing to talk about, Erin replied. We don't believe that, Lynn said, stroking her daughter's mane. Look, I know you're tired. We don't have to talk about it tonight, okay? We just want you to know that we'll always love you, and that, whatever happened, it won't change that. You can rest now, and we can talk about it later, all right. Why? Erin asked loudly, stomping her hoof. Why can't you just let it be? Now is not the time, Twilight and the others. We'll be fine, Lynn said. You know that as well as I do. Nothing happened to me, Erin repeated the lie. Nothing. Burning pain in her limbs. Her skin torn and bleeding. Aching hooves cracked and bleeding as well, rocks and debris wedged tightly into them, causing a jolt of agony up her leg every time a hoof hit the forest floor. A voice in her ear that she couldn't shut out, and the absolute terror of not being able to control her own body. Erin slumped to the floor, holding onto her emotions through an effort of will. Why are you making me remember this again? She whispered. Her mother rushed to her side, hugging her around the neck, and that was the key that unlocked the floodgates. Erin cried like a baby in her mother's arms, and the stricken look on her father's face made her cry even harder, thinking of how her pain had now hurt him, as well. It took half an hour for her to calm down enough for her to finally be able to tell her parents everything. 
It hurt, at first. It hurt to remember again, and it hurt even more to tell them, to see their reactions to what had happened to her. But the more she talked, the faster the details came, until she was spilling them out one after the other. She told them about Malachite, and running through the Everfree. She told them about Paul Belchik's betrayal, his manipulation with mood-altering drugs and a remote control he'd snuck into the design of her body. Through it all, her parents urged her to go on, to continue, comforting her all the while. She could see the horror on their faces at times, the anger and sadness. She tried to stop only to have them give her nudge after nudge, until everything came out. It felt like she was draining an infection, and it hurt, but it also lightened her burdens. And now, Malachite is probably dead, Erin said eventually, getting to the root of what had been bothering her the most this night, what she'd been trying her hardest not to think about. According to the rumors she'd heard from the medical staff in the infirmary, that's what Celestia now believed. So many times I wish something would happen to him, Erin continued shakily. He would get caught by the princesses and locked away, or he'd get crippled in a fight with the guards, or something. I was hoping the tide would hurt him, when he left to go fight it, she admitted with shame, then looked up at her parents, almost expecting to see revulsion in their eyes and mildly surprised to see only sympathy instead. He went to try and save our world, and now he's dead, and I hated him so much. Erin was crying again, though not as hysterically as before. These were tears of guilt and regret as she lay on her bed with her mother sitting next to her and stroking her mane. Her father sat on her other side, rubbing her back and trying to be comforting. I should have told him that I accepted his apology, that he was forgiven. Was he? John asked. Did you forgive him? No, she admitted reluctantly. Then you did the right thing, he said firmly. Even if it turned out this way, you did the right thing. Erin nodded mutely. Intellectually, she knew her father was right. But there was still that guilt, sitting like a cold lump of iron in her chest. It didn't change the fact that she still hated and feared Malachite even though he was likely gone. It's not like I didn't tell anyone about what he did, or how I felt, Erin said a few minutes later, yawning widely and starting to regain her calm. I told Twilight and the others. They know. They've been helping me through this. I'm glad, Lynn said, still stroking her hair. No one should have to go through something like that alone. The three of them kept talking, and eventually the subject changed to more peaceful topics. Friends, family, and plans for the future. Erin talked, yawning more and more frequently as time went on, until she finally drifted off with her head in her mother's lap at slightly after three in the morning. Her parents moved extremely carefully, using the skills they'd honed raising three children and helping with four grandchildren, gently rearranging her on the bed without waking her. Quietly, they left her room, leaving the daughter to sleep and recover. Tilda tilde asterisk tilde tilde. In spite of the previous day's momentous events, a perfectly ordinary cantaloupe sun rose just as it had for centuries, barring the occasional disruption by discord or nightmare moon. It rose on its stately course through the sky, and was a few minutes before the noon position when the sober and dignified air of the halls and corridors of Cantalope Castle were disrupted by the sound of pounding hooves. Erin ran, earning herself plenty of disapproving glares from the guards and palace staff. She didn't care, she simply ran on, moving at her best speed and occasionally sliding out of control on the polished floors to crash into the walls before recovering and moving off again. The guards outside of Celestia's quarters forced her to wait impatiently for minutes that seemed like hours while they checked to see if the princess would receive her. Finally, she was allowed in. Celestia was in her sitting room, a cup of tea and a stack of scrolls beside her as she rested on some cushions spread along the floor. Erin trotted in, frantic with the news she was carrying. Erin, Celestia began, concern showing on her face as she picked up on Erin's urgency. What's? They found him, she blurted. Celestia blinked in surprise. Him. Malachite. Erin nodded. Yes, or, I should say that they found the body he'd made, and it's still alive. Erin had been eating ravenously in the harmonics cafeteria when Maggie had found her to tell her the news. No doubt she had intended it as a warning, to let her know from a friendly face that Malachite was still alive, but Erin had almost immediately jumped up and ran off to tell Celestia. She wasn't sure why the news that Malachite had survived had made her want to tell the princess so urgently. She hoped it was only because she knew Celestia would want to know as soon as possible, and not because a living Malachite would ease the burden of her guilt, but she just wasn't sure. Is he? How is he? Celestia asked. I. I'm not sure, princess, Erin replied, ashamed at her oversight. I didn't ask, I'm sorry. Where is he? She asked, setting aside her teacup. The center of the tide, the initial impact site, Erin said. That's not all, princess. The tide is still alive. That little tidbit she'd heard in the cafeteria before Maggie had found her with the news of Malachite's survival. It was all anyone was talking about, but the initial atmosphere of despair had washed away quickly once news arrived about how little of it was apparently left. What? Celestia's head snapped up, eyes narrowed, and Erin took an instinctive step back. Just barely, though, as far as we can tell, she assured the princess quickly. There's just a small bit of it left that they found, in the center, under the stone. It's growing again, but it's only about, oh, I'd say maybe about the size of the council chambers, from what they've told me. Come with me, Celestia said, getting to her hooves and walking quickly to the door. On the way, she pulled off her chest piece and dropped it with a clang to the floor of her chambers. Um, you don't have to worry about the tide, Princess, Erin said, trotting along to keep up with her. Now that it's this small, we can take care of the rest of it ourselves. This thing may have cost me my student and friend, Erin. I will finish this myself. Yes, Princess, Erin said, intimidated. She'd never seen Celestia so severe, before, not even when she confronted what she thought were face sprites in the Everfree Forest all those weeks ago. It was more than a little frightening. She followed along beside the princess, who was now trailing several guards who had quietly fallen in behind her as she stalked through the halls of Cantalope Castle. Celestia's intensity excluded any chance for conversation, so Erin decided to just stay silent. The door to the building that housed the gate to Colorado was flung open just as Celestia reached it, and the startled ponies inside barely had time to acknowledge their princess presence before she lifted the various magic storing talks from their racks on the wall. There were eight in all, and Celestia turned to the unicorn who was attending the desk. These are fully charged, she asked him, and the stunned unicorn nodded mutely. 
Thank you, my little pony, Celestia said, lowering one of the torques around her neck where her regalia had been minutes before. The rest she simply carried beside her with her magic. The gateway to China was still up and running, the equestrians allowing the various human scientists and engineers to use the two gateways in Equestria as a shortcut between the two locations on Earth. Celestia walked straight through, ignoring the startled guards on either side. Erin trotted along at her side, soon finding herself once again in China, the sky dark, the sun on this part of Earth having long since set. Erin squawked in surprise as Celestia's magic lifted her onto her back, between the broad white wings. Then she let out a shock squeal as the princess launched herself into the air, leaving her despairing unicorn and earth pony guards behind. Hold on, Celestia instructed, and Erin buried her face in the odd, flowing mane, hugging the princess around the neck. There was a bright flash and a moment of disorientation, then another, and another, and now even the Pegasi guards were left far behind. Towards the center, you said, Celestia asked, regarding the stars thoughtfully. Erin nodded woozily, then realized that Celestia couldn't see her. Yes, princess. They teleported another six times, and Celestia burned through two of the torques, dropping them without ceremony and fitting another one around her neck each time. Erin looked ahead as much as she could, though her eyes were watering from the wind and she was shivering with the cold. Up ahead, she could just barely make out a tiny point of light in the pitch black. There, princess, she said, just ahead, and to your left. Celestia turned slightly and angled downward. As the light got closer, Erin could make out the large portable floodlights that they had placed there, in a rough circle perhaps 60 feet in diameter. Next to that circle was a crude, prefabricated shack that no doubt housed the scientists, engineers, and whatever equipment they didn't want exposed to the elements. Several large generators had been set up, and there were trucks, helicopters, and even a few smaller cars parked haphazardly around. Erin could also see a large number of headlights in the distance, coming from both east and west and converging on this site. Humanity had learned its lesson, she guessed, and was racing here in force to kill off what was left of the tide before it had a chance to recover. Celestia's landing caused a brief panic amongst those humans outside, many of whom were either setting up generators or assembling other equipment. They all stared in amazement as the princess stood, radiant and strong in the darkness. A cameraman was filming everything, possibly for a documentary. He turned the camera towards them, and Erin tried unsuccessfully to hide behind Celestia's mane. He is here, Celestia asked Erin, lifting her off of her back and setting her down on the grey stone. That's what I'd heard, princess. You may want to check the building over there. Celestia marched in, ignoring the startled guard. Erin smiled apologetically at him. She's royalty, and she's got a lot on her mind, she said, by way of explanation. The guard looked confused and said something in, presumably, Chinese. Erin blinked at him, not understanding, then shrugged and walked in behind the princess. The interior of the building was more or less as she'd expected it to be. The prefabricated plywood walls held hastily assembled metal shelves, on which rested a variety of tools and equipment. Several cots lined the walls, a few of them occupied. A large table was set up, and the group of men and women seated around it were staring at Celestia in surprise. And then, she saw Malachite. Erin gasped in shock when she saw what was left of the Suedo Alicorn. Malachite's body lay in a heap on some cushions on the floor, reduced to a mere sad shadow of his former self. He was lying on his right side, and his left side was badly scarred. His legs on that side were mostly gone, and the wing was missing entirely. His right legs had fared only slightly better, ending in stumps below the knee. The billowing face, bright mane and tail were gone, and in their place was a short growth of stubby black hair, looking sad and pathetically out of place on the once majestic frame. But worst of all were his eyes, completely devoid of any understanding or intellect, blinking and rolling around randomly. What remained of its limbs were also moving, in aimless fits and starts that reminded Erin of how an infant would sometimes move while it was learning fine motor control. Celestia was already kneeling at Malachite's side, horn glowing, the golden light cascading down his scarred hide. His eyes locked onto her for a while, and then rolled away again. After a few minutes, the princess sighed. There is very little left of him, Celestia said calmly, head bowed. The elements did what they could to heal him, and the core of his mind is intact, after a fashion. But his memories, thoughts, and sense of self are all gone. The Malachite we knew is dead. Erin moved closer, looking down at Malachite, the emotional turmoil in her heart leaving her uncertain how she felt about this development. As much as he wanted to be immortal, he may have preferred death over this, Celestia said as she reached out with a hoof, stroking his neck as the green alicorn stared blankly at her. I just noticed, she added with a brittle casualness that didn't fool Erin for a second. He doesn't have a cutie mark. I wonder if that was a conscious choice on his part, or a simple oversight. I guess I'll never know, now. Erin saw the pain in her eyes, and her heart went out to the princess. She bore no love for Malachite. In fact, the pity she felt for him now was only just starting to replace her former fear and hatred. But she understood pain and loss when she saw it, and the princess was obviously suffering. Erin didn't know what to say, so instead she knelt by her side, pressing her shoulder against Celestia's folded white leg in a gesture that she hoped would prove comforting. Celestia looked down at her, startled, and then smiled through her tears, hugging Erin to her side with a wing. They stayed like that for a few minutes, while the humans in the building shuffled uncomfortably around behind them. Finally, the princess stood and folded her wing back against her side. I shall take him back to Cantalot with me, she said, her regal bearing back in place. Please, keep him as comfortable as you can. This stallion helped to save your world, after all. The humans nearby, the ones who understood her, nodded and assured her that he would be well cared for until she returned. Good, Celestia said, then added with voice like molten iron, now, take me to what's left of the black tide. Tilda tilde asterisk tilde tilde. There was a small area outside, marked by floodlights and flags drilled into the stone that had once formed the tide itself. Celestia stared into the center of the circle, frowning with concentration. It was a circle perhaps fifty feet in diameter, and she could sense the same presence as before from under that stone. Yes. It is still here, though vastly reduced. A pity that the elements didn't finish it off. Though, the fact that it still lives gives me the chance to do so, myself. She launched herself into the air, gathering power from the six remaining torques she had brought with her. 
Once again, Celestia blazed like a sun, lighting up the night as she hovered over the edge of the remains of the tide. She poured her power into the center of it, and the stone shell glowed red before it cracked and melted. Inside, the tide itself flinched back in a truly revolting fashion, squirming and rolling in the stone that now imprisoned it. She poured more and more of her energy into it, stopping only when she hit the rock behind it. As before, it tried to stop her with a psychic assault. This time, however, it was far too weak, and she brushed off the counterattack with contempt. She burned it fiercely, drilling with her magic into the rock surrounding the tide, continuing to pour her rage and grief into her assault long past the point where the last remnant of it had been reduced to ashes. Minutes later, all that remained was a glowing bowl of semi-molten rock, sixty feet in diameter at the ridge. Celestia cast out with her mind once again and detected nothing. The tide was now well and truly dead. She landed, discarding the now exhausted magic storing talks. She turned to smile at the crowd of stunned humans behind her. I seem to have exhausted my magic, and it's quite a long way back to Equestria. Could I trouble you for some transportation? Tilda tilde asterisk tilde tilde. And then what happened? Twilight asked, sitting up in her bed. The six friends were all in the same room, each restricted to their beds by stern, no-nonsense nurses. Applejack and Dash had learned the hard way that they were still far too weak to simply get past their white garb guardians. We came back, Erin said. It seems a little anticlimactic, but that's all there was to it. We were loaded into a truck with Malachite, and they drove us back to the gateway. It took hours. What about Malachite? Pinkie Pie asked, in between sips of the chocolate malt that she'd somehow managed to get into the room. Erin shook her head. I don't know what happened to Malachite after that. Celestia took him somewhere, and I didn't think it was any of my business to ask her what her plans were. Erin didn't know what to think of Malachite. Her fading feelings of hate, anger and fear were twisted up with the guilt, pity and shame she'd felt seeing what had happened to him. That she'd wished him harm, and then he'd been so badly hurt defending the earth wasn't something she felt she'd be able to shake any time soon, if ever. He'd abused her greatly, but he faced the tide in an attempt to save the world and suffered much worse than she had in doing so. He'd been arrogant, condescending and cruel to her, but now there was none of that left, his mind an empty shell. And, in the end, his sacrifice had saved the earth, though his arrogance had almost doomed it at the same time. Her feelings couldn't settle down, swirling around in a big mess in her chest. She pushed the thoughts aside, deciding to concentrate on her friends, instead. So, when do you guys think you'll be getting out of here? She asked, forcing a smile. We've got less than a week before my mom forces Thanksgiving on you guys. You're still all planning on coming, right? Sure, Pinky said, putting the empty malt glass aside. I'd never miss my first human party. Well, it's not really a party, so much as a holiday gathering, Erin clarified. It's a time to get together with friends and family, to talk and eat and think about all the things you're grateful for. Sounds lovely, Rarity said. I'd love to come. The others quickly reaffirmed the desire to go. It's too bad the rest of my family can't come, too. I think my nieces would love to meet you guys, Erin said with a more genuine smile, imagining the little girl's reactions to the ponies. You should ask Maggie if she can bring, M. Applejack said, nothing more important than family. What about friends? Dash asked jokingly. That's family, AJ asserted. Erin let her friends bicker for a little while, feeling better just by being near them. I have an announcement, guys, she said, eventually. All eyes turned to her, and she shuffled her hooves uncomfortably before she spoke. The Ascent Labs will be done with their repairs in the next couple of days. And, um, after Thanksgiving, I'm going to turn back into a human. She glanced around, surprised to see only acceptance on her friends' faces. Except for Pinkie Pie, who was pouting slightly. I'm still going to call you, Sunflower, Pinkie said, crossing her forelegs across her chest. That's fine, Erin said, laughing. I was afraid you'd be upset. Why would we be upset? Twilight asked, obviously confused. You make a good pony, but you're still a human. It makes sense you'd want to change back. The others agreed, and Erin felt some relief. I've already talked it over with Maggie and Dr. Fisher, she said. The Ascent Lab here can only be used for what they call, official business, which counts me turning back to human. But, I told them I also want to study magic, so. Well, after a while, they'll let me turn back into a pony again. A real pony this time, instead of a fake one. How are they gonna do that? Applejack asked. I thought you didn't know how equestrian ponies worked. Well. Malachite left a bunch of data behind, before he blew stuff up. We know a lot about pony anatomy now. The only thing to decide is, what kind of pony should I be first? First, Twilight repeated. What do you mean? Well, I want to study each type of pony magic, Erin clarified. So, that means I have to spend time as each kind. So, should I be an earth pony, unicorn, or Pegasus first? Pegasus, Rainbow Dash said immediately, were the coolest. Why, Twilight asked. Well, we can fly, first of all, Rainbow started, and Twilight laughed, holding up a hoof. We'll take Pegasi coolness superiority as a given, she said. I meant why choose. You could make yourself a combination of all three, like Malachite did. Oh, Erin said, rocking back on her hooves. I honestly hadn't thought of that. That's a good idea, I guess, but... But, what? Twilight asked. I don't know how comfortable I am being that similar to Malachite, Erin admitted. I guess I didn't think about that, Twilight said, shaking her head. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. It's a good suggestion. That's not important, Pinky said seriously, then grinned. Now that the tide is gone, we need to have a party. Erin laughed. Humanity is way ahead of you, there, Pinkie Pie. Tilda tilde asterisk tilde tilde. Say what you will, John said, they have nice televisions here. Lynn made a wordless noise of agreement, watching the screen in their room. As you can see, I'm here in Trafalgar Square, where the celebration shows no sign of slowing down, let alone stopping, a pretty young reporter in a yellow jacket and skirt said. A group of rambunctious people wandered behind her, some of them wearing fake unicorn horns on their heads, some wearing fake pegasus wings on their jackets, and a few brave souls wearing both. 
The cold isn't keeping people indoors, not these days. Nothing seems to be able to dull anyone's enthusiasm. It's hard to believe it's all over, Lin said as the reporter continued talking. They haven't confirmed it's over yet, John said, and Lin slapped him lightly on the arm. Why can't you ever be optimistic, she said. I like being a pessimist. It's more fun being wrong as a pessimist than if you're wrong as an optimist. He grinned at her, and she rolled her eyes at him. The video of Celestia blasting what was left of the tide had been rebroadcast on every channel, alternating with footage of the light of the elements crawling across the tide. Several reports had been cobbled together, with speculation on what had happened. Official word was that the face sprites were part of the equestrians' plan to destroy the tide, some odd magical spell that they created so that the elements would actually work this time. Reaction to that was mostly positive, though the occasional kook was interviewed who loudly proclaimed that this proved that the equestrians were evil or satanic, or had been in league with the tide from the beginning. I wish they'd stop interviewing those people, John said as the latest one declared their conspiracy theories to the camera. Anyone who's not an idiot knows better than to listen to them, Lin replied. There's a surprising number of idiots in the world, John replied. Said the pessimist. Granted. They watched the celebrations on the television for a while longer, until John broke the silence again. I should have bought stock in a fireworks company, he said. Tilda tilde asterisk tilde tilde. Maggie was more tired than she'd ever been in her life, excluding after her children were born. The two days since the elements of harmony had been used the tide had seen massive numbers of scientists come through, all on their way to China to try and study the remains of what had been Earth's greatest threat. The now destroyed central core of the tide wasn't the only remaining pocket of the creature that had been left intact by the elements of harmony. Surveys were finding more and more of it, from tiny little drops of it to large pools, all encapsulated in the stone and, without the signal that the princesses had told them about, completely inert. It would take decades to dig it all out and destroy it, if they could even find it all. That was bad news number one, and one that was being kept quiet for now. No need to ruin everyone's celebrations quite yet, after all. Bad news number two was much more personal. Maggie rubbed at her temples, wondering how she was going to break this particular bit of bad news to a couple of people she'd really enjoyed getting to know. The married couple sitting across the table from her watched her expectantly and warily. Maggie decided to just be blunt about it. There was too much going on to attempt to be overly tactful. You can go home, now, if you want, she told John and Lynn Olson. What do you mean? John asked. I mean, don't get me wrong, we're not complaining, but... News of Ascent has leaked. That damned film crew somehow managed to get some video files past security, including Erin stating that she was, a human turned into a pony, during a party shortly after humanity arrived in Equestria. Maggie remembered that statement vaguely, though Erin's terrible karaoke shortly after that had nearly driven it from her memory. And someone who works for us and who should have known better has started talking to reporters. The news is all over the place, now. I'm afraid your daughter is going to be a little bit of a star for the foreseeable future. Oh, God, Lynn said. They know her name. Here, let me show you, Maggie said, then click the remote. The large screen in the conference room turned onto a newscast that she'd recorded earlier. A handsome older man in a blue suit was sitting behind a desk, looking calmly into the camera. The latest shocking news from Project Harmonix is this video, and the accompanying information obtained by sources on the inside. We've confirmed with various anonymous sources inside the Harmonix compound that there was another project in the works, one called Ascent, the purpose of which was to use experimental nanotechnology to turn one young woman into a pony in order to gather information from Equestria, prior to diplomatic relations being opened. That young woman's name, according to our sources, it's Erin Olson. The video switched to an older picture of Erin, a few years out of date but still quite obviously her. Lynn let out a gasp of dismay. You may know her better as, Sunflower, the reporter continued. That's right, according to our sources, the pony who traveled from India to Colorado, and later showed up in the small town of Rockwell with a bunch of other ponies, was apparently once a human. Officials at the Harmonics Lab, as well as the International Committee for Human Survival, have all declined to comment, but we have pretty compelling evidence that this is the case. Does Erin know? John asked, and Maggie paused the broadcast. I told her this morning. She didn't take it well, Maggie said. That was stating it mildly, as Erin first reacted by laughing hysterically, then stomping and cursing in anger, and finally going off to sulk in a nice hot bath for a while. That wasn't even counting the hoof she kicked through the sheetrock in her bedroom. Here are your phones and tablets, she said. No need to keep you cut off anymore. I'd advise a strict, no comment, reply to any questions by reporters, though. Well, I'm not going anywhere until we sort this out, and make sure Erin's okay and human again, John said resolutely. Lynn nodded, and then her eyes widened. We need to call the boys. They'll be worried sick. Oh god, you're right. Oh, and check this out, 217 missed calls on my phone, 357 new emails. Lynn checked her own phone, blanching with shock at what she saw waiting for her. I'm guessing the reporters figured out who we are, he said. Most likely, Maggie said, nodding. We've moved your sons and their families to safe houses, for the time being, to keep them away from the swarms of reporters. Oh, thank God for that, Lynn said, then started dialing. Hi, sweetie, it's mom. Yes, yes, slow down, hold on, I'm, yes, I know, I saw. John shook his head as his wife was peppered with questions. That would be Alan, he's the one who always demanded answers. Todd, actually, Lynn said, then said into the phone, no, I was talking to your father. Yes, he's here, that's why I was talking to him. When is Erin scheduled to be turned back? John asked, ignoring his phone as it started to vibrate its way across the table. The lab will be up and running in two days. Another day to test and shake things down, and then Erin can go in whenever she's ready. Ah, good, John said. How long will it take to turn her back? About a week, maybe ten days, Maggie replied. Hold on, dear, I've got to talk to someone, Lynn said into her phone before turning to Maggie. That's not acceptable, she'll miss Thanksgiving. Hon, John started, but Lynn shook her head. No, John. We can have Thanksgiving together this year, as a family. I don't care if Erin is a pony or a human, I want us all together. 
Maggie, can you arrange to have our sons and their families brought here? Ah. Sure, I guess, Maggie said, assuming they'll want to come. I'll take care of that, trust me, Lynn said, then put the phone back up to her ear. So, Todd, here's what's going to happen. Tilda tilde asterisk tilde tilde. Robert Thompson cleared his throat as he stepped up to the podium. He held up his hand, and the restless reporters settled down immediately. Ladies, gentlemen, I thank you for coming. I have a statement that I'd like to make, and then I'll take a few questions. I ask that you hold your questions until the end. Thank you. He took a sip of water, pulled out his notes, and then launched into his statement. In the early days of fighting the tide, we realized that it was using nanotechnology to convert terrestrial matter into more of itself. You all know that. What you don't know is that one of the early projects we started up was to use and enhance our own existing Earth nanotechnology, in order to try and fight the tide on equal footing. It proved less than successful, but it yielded other results that, if it weren't for the tide, would have made life on Earth much more interesting. We called it Project Ascent, and that's what I'm here to tell you about tonight. Dr. Herman Fisher and his team are the leads on this. Dr. Fisher is, quite frankly, the most incredible genius I've ever met. The entire thing was his baby, start to finish. He created the nanomachines, he created the mainframe and the remote communications array that controlled them, and he came up with the routines that allowed us to convert matter from one form to another. His team didn't stop there, however. He theorized that he could use a scent to change an organism's biology to do things as mundane as healing paper cuts, to as extreme as modifying humanity to survive under harsher conditions. That was one of our fallbacks in regards to Project Harmonics. If we found a world that was almost habitable to humanity, then perhaps we could modify ourselves to be able to better survive in that environment. Robert kept to himself the fact that the Ascent nanomachines that Dr. Fisher used were heavily influenced by damaged and inactive black tide nanomachines. Anything that touched even remotely on the tide caused unease and fear in the general population, and he didn't want to start a panic. What he told these reporters already had more than a few of them on edge. Then we found Equestria, Robert continued. This wonderful world that fitted all of our needs, except that it was occupied by ponies, or pony sapiens as you folks have been calling them on the news. And, as we later found out, also occupied by several other sapien species as well. We asked Dr. Fisher if we could turn volunteers into ponies, in order to meet and assess the locals, to determine the best approach to opening diplomatic ties with Equestria. We had one shot to make a good impression, and we wanted as much data as we could before we took that shot. In order to keep things at least somewhat quiet, it was decided that only Project Harmonic staff would be asked to volunteer. In the end, only one woman, a brave young lady named Erin Olson, volunteered to undergo the long and somewhat risky procedure to change herself into a pony. Coupled with that was the further risk of exploring a completely new world, full of new risks, and... Well, Erin proved to be quite a treasure, I can tell you. She faced all of that without even blinking. In the end, the information she retrieved, and the good relations she established with the equestrian government, led directly to the equestrians helping us to defeat the tide and save our world. Quite simply, we would still be planning an evacuation of the planet if it weren't for Erin. And that's why I'm asking all of you to have the common courtesy to leave her alone and not bombard her or her family with questions, requests for interviews, or things like that. She wants to lead a quiet, normal life, and I think she deserves our respect, and she deserves to be treated fairly. Now, are there any questions? Hands shot up in the air, and voices were raised, shouting questions in English flavored with dozens of different accents. Robert pointed to one person at random. Yes, you. What's your question, Mr. Thompson? Is the change permanent? Absolutely not. Erin will be starting the process to turn her back into a human in a couple of weeks, now that all the excitement is dying down. You, the lady in the purple sweater. You have a question. Yes, sir. Why a couple of weeks? Why the delay? Due to a classified request by the equestrian government. They had, well, a little something they wanted us to do for them. Considering all they've done for us, naturally we said yes. It sounds like a scent can cure disease and injuries on an unprecedented scale. Will people from all walks of life be given a fair chance at it, or is this going to be reserved for the rich and the well-connected? Good question. Yes, Ascent can, potentially, cure pretty much any disease and repair any injury, including old age. At the moment, we only have one working facility, which is a prototype facility and not open to general public use, though we have several more opening up soon around the world. The cost is immense, but we're using what's left of the International Emergency Fund to finance it. Once it's all up and running, we'll start running folks through, starting with terminally ill children and working our way up to terminally ill adults. There was a brief explosion of questions that Robert silenced by holding up his hands. Sorry, that was the decision. Children first, terminal illnesses first. As much as I'd like to give back sight to every blind person and so on, we have to take the most critical cases first, and children are obviously the most urgent of those cases. We won't be able to save everyone, not until we get a lot more centers open and a lot more staff trained, but we'll do the best we can. If you're wondering if a cent will be available for things like making people young again, the answer is, eventually, yes. Once we no longer have younger people with terminal illnesses. That may seem unfair to older folks, but the thought is that the children deserve a chance to live as long as the older folks do. Sorry if that seems unfair, but that's the way it's going to be at least on the official side. We'll also be licensing out the technology to businesses, in order to increase the number of facilities as rapidly as possible, and to increase innovation. Unfortunately, while we will definitely set guidelines for those businesses and how they're to operate, we won't be able to stop them from charging for their services, which may set the cost of using Ascent-based technology out of range for many people. That's regrettable, but it was determined that this was the best way to get the technology out there, and to rapidly get the cost down. Next question. You, with the yellow tie. Is it true that you intended that all humans migrating to Equestria would be turned into ponies, perhaps against their will, in collusion with the Equestrian government? Dead silence reigned for a few seconds. What the hell are you talking about? Robert asked, incredulous. Are you insane? Where in the world did you get that idea? Even if we wanted to, we don't have the resources to turn 7 billion humans into ponies. You, in the grey suit, you're up. Thank you, sir. 
If we manage to open enough ascent centers that we can actually keep people eternally young, doesn't that mean we'll have a population boom? What are the plans to deal with that excess population? Good question. We're still going ahead with the plans to settle in Zanabra, though we've offered to buy the land directly from the zebras ourselves, relieving the equestrians of the necessity of trading their own land for it. We're still in negotiations on a final price. The equestrians are still offering assistance in getting the land more habitable for us, and now we can afford to take our time and really plan things out well. In addition, Project Harmonix is still running. We're sure to find other worlds out there, habitable ones. The UN is setting up a special group that will handle requests for people to migrate, perhaps even to create new nations on these worlds. We're looking at the dawn of an age of unprecedented human growth and achievement, folks. It's going to be exciting. Next question, you in the front, here. Speaking of Harmonix, now that we no longer need the equestrians, are we cancelling the agreements to allow them access to the new worlds that we find? Are we still building them ascent labs? We're not changing the agreements, Robert said. Next. How can you justify that, though, the same man interrupted. We have people here who are sick, or who have lost their homes, and you want to waste resources on ponies. This is the last non-ascent question I'll take, because this needs to be addressed, Robert Thompson said, scowling at the man. We made this agreement with them, when they had everything to lose and we had everything to gain. Now that we're in better shape, you think we should just cancel the agreement? Forget for just a moment that the only reason that breaking the treaty is even an option is because of the bravery and sacrifice of the equestrians. Forget how much we owe them for saving our world. Forget all of that and consider this, instead. These new species that we've met, this is their first impression of us. They're just getting to know humanity. Are you seriously suggesting that the first thing we do is break a signed treaty with them when the ink is barely dry? Have you so little shame? No, we're not going to do that. We are better than that. Now, I'm going to the next question, and if you continue disrupting this conference you will be escorted out. The press conference went on for another half an hour after that, until Robert finally had enough and called an end to the questions. He went off stage and back into a small room, collapsing into a sofa with a sigh as his assistant came up and gave him a glass of water. Thanks, Becky, he said. Do me a favor, would you? Call Maggie Henson and see if Erin would be willing to hold a press conference or do an interview of her own, soon. It might help to dispel some of the interest if someone can ask her some questions directly. Will do, boss, Becky said, and left the room. Robert rubbed his temples as he lay back on the small couch. In just a few days, everything had changed. For the better, of course, he wasn't complaining. Things like Ascent getting leaked before they were ready was really small potatoes compared to the fact that the tide was no longer a threat. Still, it looked like he'd have to keep putting off that vacation he'd promised his wife over three years ago. She was not going to be happy. Tilda tilde asterisk tilde tilde. I really don't want to do this, Erin groused as the pony makeup specialist eyed her critically. I know, Erin, Robert Thompson said sympathetically. I only ask because, if they get some answers, maybe they'll be satisfied and start to leave you alone. And how likely do you think that is? Erin asked. Not very, he admitted. Still, it's worth a shot, don't you think? Erin sighed, and then grunted as another pony pulled the sash tight on her dress, an emerald green number that had been put together at the last minute by a human designer. It looked nice, but it was extremely uncomfortable. She longed for one of the dresses that Rarity had made for her, but this had all come together at the last minute, and she hadn't thought of grabbing a wardrobe before she left. Being a pony has sure made me lazy in packing, she thought ruefully. There was a knock on the door and a young man poked his head in. Whenever you're ready, Miss Olson, he said. Erin's mouth went dry as she walked towards the door. Break a leg, Robert said. Erin smiled weakly, and then followed the aide through the back of the stage. Susan Chang was a popular, middle-aged talk show host, one that her mother loved. It had been agreed on that she would do the interview with Erin, on her usual set, but without the live audience. Only the camera crew, director, and other required personnel were there. Erin walked out on stage without any kind of pomp or circumstance and smiled nervously at Susan Chang as the human woman knelt down on the stage and extended her hand. Erin put out her hoof, and they shook. You look nervous, her interviewer said. I am, Erin admitted, and the woman laughed. That's hard to believe, after all you've been through. Still, I get it. Don't worry, this isn't going out live. We can cut anything out that you don't like. Does that make you feel better? It does, Erin said with relief. Good, Miss Shang said, standing back up. Why don't you sit here, on this couch? I'll take the chair, and we can get started. Erin climbed into the sofa, then lay down on her belly with her legs tucked up. She smiled again at the woman seated across from her, who patted her comfortingly and turned to the camera. We're recording, she asked. Yes, Sue, the director called out from his booth. Whenever you're ready. Okay. Erin, we're going to get started now, all right. Sounds good, she replied with false confidence. Susan cleared her throat and faced one of the cameras on the set. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a very special show, and a very special guest for you this morning. This is the one and only time I'm going to do a pre-recorded show, rather than a live one, but I think you'll agree that my guest today is worth it. You may know her as Sunflower, the pony who crossed the world, or you may know her as Erin Olsen, the brave young woman who explored a new world, and ended up finding the allies we needed to save our own. She's here today, and she's willing to tell us a little bit about what happened. Erin, why don't you start? Where would you like me to start? She asked, a little panicked. Why not at the beginning, right before you became a pony? Susan suggested. All right, Erin said, then marshaled her thoughts. She turned to the camera as well, and said, hi. 